Hello, my name is Robert Williams. My profession is as an artist and oil painter, and I would uh, like for you to en enjoy my 32 Ford Roadster. I uh, grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and parts of the Deep South. Enormous availability of early V8 Fords to make hot rods. My parents in the South, my father, owned a very large drive-in restaurant and had a stable of stock cars that uh, he campaigned on dirt tracks in the Deep South. So I was raised at a very early age around race cars and motorcycles. There was a masculine, a young male attraction to machinery and speed. I developed a, a real uh, propensity for hot rod Fords. So I badgered my father into getting me a 34 Ford 51 Coupe at 11 years old. My parents finally divorced and I moved to Albuquerque and Albuquerque had a, a real active hot rod uh, scene. So of course I fell in, had a number of early Fords and started working on a 26 Ford Roadster T-Bucket with an Olds engine. And I wasted about three years working on this one Roadster. My fiance wouldn't tolerate the car and said she was a hot rod widow and dump me. So after spending a long, long time and a lot of money on this T Roadster, I just walked away from it and came to California to get an art education. And I consciously tried to stay away from hot rods. And California to me was always the promised land. The weather was wonderful. There was attractive beach bunny girls. And then there was an enormous availability of early V8 Fords to make hot rods. But after job after job, the only job that I could find was the art director for Ed Big Daddy Roth. And I was thrust right back into the hot rod world. Ed Roth in the late 50s was a pinstriper and did monster t-shirts. And he was a protege and a follower of a fellow named Von Dutch. Now, Von Dutch made a big splash about 1955 in all the car magazines doing pinstriping. He brought back pinstriping as an old dying art. It used to just be used on fire trucks and wagons and some automobiles back at the turn of the century. But he brought it back as a wild, wild abstract art form. And Ed Roth caught onto this too. And as a young man, as a, a aspiring artist, looking at car magazines in 55, 56, I saw this and was really stimulated by what was going on the West Coast, the flame paint jobs and scallops and paneling and whatnot. So I met Roth in 1960 at a large art show at the Albuquerque Arena and I didn't really care for the guy. I, th I thought he was a fast-talking California big operator. He, he was there with uh, the outlaw, and I love the car, but I just didn't, I, I had run across so many fast-talking California shysters, I just presumed he was another one of these characters. So anyway, years later, 60, 64, 65, I, there was a job available at uh, Roth Studios. So I went down and showed him my portfolio, and Ed said, well, if I knew you were alive, I'd hunted you up. So I worked as his art director for five years and made a really good income. Me and Suzanne had already married in 64. And I was re-immersed into this world that I tried to get away from and I am tied into it to this moment. Well, in 1963 when I came out to California and you looked in the LA Times and the used car classifieds, was, every, every week there was a couple of 32 Roadsters in there for sale and they weren't very expensive. Nobody was killing each other over them, but they, they were a very popular car. Are, there's a lot of them around. I sold an awful lot of 32 Ford Roadsters in California because of the weather. So as I was there day by day working at Ross Studios, I sat next to a fellow named Jim Jacobs, which is one of um, Ed Ross fabricators. And Jake always had great cars. So I made the mistake of asking him, would he be able, had the possibility of finding me a 32 Ford Roadster? Every day I'd ask him that. After about four or five months, he came in one morning. He said, get your paycheck. I found a 32 Roadster for you down at Seal Beach, $200. And so we went down there and I can't remember the, I think the guy was named Gordy. He had this roadster sitting on a frame. It was amazing that the body had not been channeled. It had not been cut up. It looked like it had about 10 or 15 young, lazy owners that had put their touch on it, but nobody serious enough to really cut it up and mangle it. It had all the affications of uh, the trends through the 40s and 50s, like the cowl vent was filled and the door handles removed and items like that. So anyway, I immediately saw this 
thing was a precious find. So I, for $200, I got a body, a windshield, a frame, a rear end, and a pink slip. So now that's this roadster here. I've owned it 52 years. It's like my second wife. So we put it in the back of uh, Jake's pickup, and I didn't have a place to store it at the time because I was living in Hollywood, but Alan Kayan, they let me uh, store it over at his house. So I put it over there and threw tarps on it, and it sat there for years. And then finally I got a house and had room for the Roadster. I just had a chassis, you know, and I accumulated a lot, lot of the rare parts, but um, Jake had started a company with Pete Shapiro called uh, Pete and Jake's, and one of the ace practices practitioners over there and fabricators was a fella named Pete Eastwood. He was a very, very famous hot rodder, but he had a 32-31 de coupe that he drove. He, he built the chassis at 17 years old and drove it coast to coast a couple of times. And he kept the car, and it was his everyday cars, this 32-31 de coupe. But he'd had some rather nasty wrecks in it, some really bad, bad wrecks in it. And he had gotten a divorce, and he let his father-in-law have it. Then his father father in law got he got it back from his father in law and it was like it had the the bad hoodoo on it, you know? He didn't he didn't want it. So he started to part it out and I made a deal with Pete Shapiro and Jim Jacobs. If they could get that frame away from Eastwood and set it up for a four speed transmission that I would do t shirt designs for it. He had a big party and it was like the temperature was like about hundred and five down in Temple City behind Pete and Jake's and they had a big beard drinking party with about 50 people there while they tore this 3 one coupe apart to get me the frame. So only Eastwood and me and Pete Shapiro would actually go out in the sun to work or take it apart. And you had a garage there with 40 people drunk inside watching us take it apart. But uh, that was a very uh, well-known day with a lot of people. That was quite a party watching this real nice coupe just get completely dismantled and going in all directions. So that's the frame, Pete Eastwood's very first frame. He's done hundreds and hundreds of 32 Ford frames, but this was his first at 17 years old. And it's quite elaborate underneath, except for the fact that it's been in some rather rough wrecks. One of them was hitting a curb head on in the neighborhood of 100 miles an hour. And as Eastwood described it, well, it's pretty rough when you hit a curb like that, but after you drive over your own front end and you get the frame horns up on the sidewalk, things go pretty easy. It had been in a couple of more bad wrecks like this, and he had a bad habit of going out on Friday drinking and wrecking the car, and then Saturday and Sunday working all day to repair it. And then it was a cycle. Eastwood would go out and hit the curb and bend the rear axle almost weekly, and then he would take it over to Eric Vaughn and have the axle housing straightened on a lathe. Well, this has happened so many times and so badly, the axle housing housing in the rear was bent so bad that the axle could no longer be straightened. So Eric Vaughn sliced the axle housing and moved it up into position where the bearings were parallel and welded it together. If you look at the rear end, it's like a slices of sausage that have been moved. Now you, you ask, why, would I, why, why wouldn't I change that? Well, the axle's in good working shape, the bearings are in precision, but it's uh, just part of the legend of this car. Me and Pete Eastwood spent a couple of days with T-squares and plumb bobs and porta power straightening it, about as straight as I think it's ever gonna get. But it's got a coil spring rear end in it and torsion bar, uh, sway bars in it, and it's a pretty fancy little frame. When I agreed to get the work done, when Pete Shapiro wanted to help me get the chassis and get this thing rolling. I've had so many hot rods as a young man that I tried to be fussy with and never got them really running. So I decided I'm going to just make this thing a rolling shit box and get it safe and dependable. I can live with that romance. Back in 1979, this was absolutely unheard of to purposely drive a, a rough looking car around. So I had a talk with Pete Shapiro and he said, well, you know, we'll help you with this Roadster as long as you promise must never to paint it and we know that there'll always be one primer 32 Ford Roadster on the streets of LA. I said, well, that was my very intention. Well, what I'm describing to you was the very first beater or rat rod. This was the first rat rod period. Now you have a lot of people claim they have, they've started rat rod. This was the very first, and this has got documentation. Now the word rat rod came from Gray Baskerville. He used to be an associate editor at Hot Rod and Car Craft and Rod and Custom and a number of them. And he come up with the word rat rod. So I come up with a car and uh, uh, Grave Baskerville come up with the term rat rod. So that's history.
See. Now, as the years progressed, everybody had rat rods, and they had the most uncouth, uninteresting looking, gobbled together messes called rat rods. And I'm left with my primer roadster, and I just kind of left me in some of my earlier desires. Now, one desire I always had as a kid, because I'd always been around race cars, is to paint a hot rod like a race car, because you can paint a race car enormously flamboyant, and it can be considered accurate. There is a, a virtuosity in the wild paint job in a race car that's considered conservative. That the, A race car is designed to be seen from grandstands at a long distance. It's supposed to be a real public pleaser. So I decided, well, I'm going to paint this thing up like a 40s or 50s redneck race car. And my, my intention was to put the body back almost stock with the, the side curtain socket holes and open the cowl vent and put the door handles back in it so it looks like an idiot got a hold of a real good 32 Ford Roadster and painted it like a race car. So it would give the impression the person that painted really didn't care about the car, it, but he just didn't, wasn't interested in pulling all the accessories off of it. So that was my thrust 20 years ago when this car was painted like this. The painting was done by uh, Scott Gilner. Scott Gilner's a legend unto himself. See. So Scott did the body work and put the rumble seat in and uh, put in all the old appointments and opened the cowl vent and made it look like a pretty well-preserved 32 Ford with a crazy paint job. I had a fellow named Bill Marigold do the lettering and I'd painted the cartoon. So I had it all laid out. Now it's got 24 karat gold leaf on it like a race car would have. Bill Marigold, while he was gilting it, and the gilting was pretty expensive, he says, you know, on the left side, the hinge is in the way so you have to move the number. I said, Bill, don't move the number. Guilt the hinge. He says, well, you can't guilt the hinge. I said, no, you have to guilt the hinge. He said, well, no, no, move the number. No, I said, guilt the hinge. So I got a guilted hinge. I got $200 in the guilt on the hinge. See? I am known for a couple of things, as we mentioned already. I'm pretty well known for working at Ross Studios in the Hot Rod fraternity. But I worked for years as one of the owners of Zap Comics in San Francisco. And they were very, very successful in the late 60s, 70s, and 80s. Very, very famous. I've always been a painter, and I tried to take the underground comic ethic into oil paintings, and in a, a, a rather wholehearted attempt to bring realism back to painting, because uh, fine arts had drifted off for the last 50 years into abstract expressionism and considered any attempt at realism as a, just illustration. And I wanted to write that wrong and uh, made a pretty good living doing it. I am the founder of one of the top art magazines in an attempt to bring that justice to part. Juxtapose Magazine is my magazine I started. And, 1994, and it, uh, over a period of about 12 years, become the top-selling art magazine in the world. And you're still painting until this day? I'm still, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll be painting here in about an hour. About the future of young people getting into hot rods, I thought Aaron Kayan and his friends were the last generation to get into real hot rods. And it was surprising that they even did it, because I thought it died out in the 60s. I thought it was over with in the 60s, especially during the period of the Vietnam War. But somehow, Aaron and a whole other generation picked it up. By this time, the cars had got very impractically expensive. So now the question is, will Aaron's son, Ben, pick it up? Which is, you know, he can do it indirectly through Mustangs and Camaros and things like that. But getting into finding the old Fords, you know, that's, that's a wealthy man's game now. But it would sure be great to see if they could do it.